There's always a risk when you're building really, really quickly that you're not necessarily building something that is in fact going to last. What I'd like to do is just shift away a little bit from the official plan policy and talk about some of the different ways that we implement uh, that policy. And the first I'd like to talk about is neighborhood design guidelines. Now, Leaside is unique because you've had neighborhood design guidelines for some time. Now, of course, they've been guidelines, and uh, at times they've shaped the outcome, at other times they haven't. And there's really, at times, been some confusion about what to do with them, whether they're regulatory or not. We, in fact, have an initiative underway right now in order to create what we're calling a template for neighborhoods. It's really a how-to guideline so that neighborhoods can create their own guidelines that then can become a document that is either endorsed by City Council and or is used by Committee of Adjustment when evaluating proposals that are come for, coming forward uh, anticipating change in neighborhoods. Part of this gets at one of the challenges we have. The official plan policies are for the whole city. And then we go down to the secondary plans that are for specific areas. But neighborhoods are even more specific. Sometimes you've got a cluster of just a relatively small area of blocks and streets that have their own character that we ought to protect. Neighborhood design guidelines, and I'll talk a bit about heritage conservation districts, but neighborhood design guidelines are one of the ways, one of the tools that we can use to ensure that as change takes place in our neighborhoods, that it is consistent with the overall vision that the community has for that neighborhood. So this is a process that's underway right now. We have two neighborhoods that we're doing pilot projects in. Um, one is in Long Branch in Etobicoke, and one is a little north of, north of here, up in, up in North York in Willowdale. And in both of those neighborhoods, we are both creating the template and creating the guidelines, the objective being that those guidelines, those, those, the template that can then be utilized by other neighborhoods in order to both go through a process and create a deliverable that then can be used to evaluate proposals as they come forward in your community. This is an initiative that um, I began early this year as a, in, as a way to try and find a solution for this challenge of meeting very specific nuanced guidelines at the neighborhood level and knowing at the end of the day uh, it's highly unlikely that that's something that's going to be um, pulled together by the city planning department is going to be something that's need to be shaped by the city planning partner part, department but driven by local communities. We also have in our official plan a whole series of very specific policies that relate to neighborhoods. Now, we've been undergoing a five-year review of our official plan. Because the city is so big, we have been evaluating different policies on a thematic basis. So for example, first we looked at heritage policies and all of the heritage policies were updated. They were brought before city council. Then we went and defended them at the Ontario Municipal Board. It's quite a long process. Then they were approved by the province, and now we have updated heritage policies in the official plan. We've also done that for our transportation policies, and we're in the process of doing that for our environmental policies. Uh, some of you may have seen the news that at our last city council meeting, city council endorsed 68 new environmentally sensitive areas that will be protected from development in the city. Our neighborhood policies are also up for review at this time, and we are strengthening these policies in order to reinforce the character of specific neighborhoods. So for example, we've added some language around ensuring that the prevailing building type is in fact uh, what is used to determine, it, determine the predominant form of development in a given neighborhood. This gets into the weeds a little bit, but this is, in, this is important stuff in terms of putting some of the parameters around how decisions are made and how decisions are evaluated, both at the Committee of Adjustment and at the Ontario Municipal Board, when ultimately we need to go and uh, defend them. So that's a little bit about what we're doing at the um, <coughs> neighborhood level, but that's a citywide initiative that will have some opportunities and repercussions for Leaside. Another critical um, initiative underway is the Laird Drive focus area. Now, how many people in the room participated in one way or another in Eglinton Connects? Put your hand up in the air. Oh, I thought it would be higher. Um, so that's probably, I would say, I don't know, like 1 15th of the room participated in Eglinton Connects. 
In the context of the building of the LRT along Eglinton, we undertook a study of the entire 22 kilometers of the corridor. And we undertook that study to look at a few different things. One of them was, where are the areas that can accommodate more growth and change as a result of this investment in public transit? That was the first question. The other question was around how should the streetscape be redesigned as a result of this investment in infrastructure. So we looked at greening the corridor, we looked at how people move in the corridor, adding cycling lanes and widening sidewalks, and then we also looked at the built form. And we brought all of that before City Council and that was approved at City Council. In the context of that work, we identified six what we called focus areas. And those focus areas were areas for a variety of reasons could accommodate more intensification than the majority of the corridor. And Laird is one of those focus areas that was identified in the context of Eglinton Connects. It was uh, approved by City Council and policy now. Laird is one of the key focus areas where we will see intensification. In the planning policy that went before City Council, it was clearly articulated that the next step is to, keep, is to create a detailed plan. So that's the work that is forthcoming. There were some demonstration plans that were included in the context of Eglinton Connects when it went before City Council, but we were very clear that those were uh, demonstration, plan, demonstration plans. So in the context of the uh, layered focus area, we are going to be uh, undertaking additional study to identify how the area will evolve and grow and change over time. And that will lead to either a secondary plan, so again, that will get placed into the regulatory framework, or even possibly a development permit bylaw might be one of the outcomes. Now we identified that before the Laird focus area could begin, that the uh, long-awaited and long-promised Leaside area-wide traffic study needed to be undertaken by transportation services. This was in fact um, authorized in 2013 um, uh, at City Council for the General Manager of Transportation Services to undertake this work. From our perspective, this is a critical input into the Laird area, uh, focus area study. That we actually need, the transportation piece is actually a critical driver and we need some of that detailed analysis from the area-wide traffic study in order to uh, move forward with the focus study. So the good news is this work is now proceeding. It's been budgeted for 2016. The Laird focus area is also proceeding and has been budgeted for 2016 to be initiated. And we've been working with Councillor Burnside over the course of the past several months to look at the scope, uh, to identify how to advance these studies, uh, to figure out how the sequencing will work but there's going to be a tremendous amount of activity that will be happening in 2016 as a follow-up on that earlier work. It's important to note that the area-wide traffic study will in fact focus on operational solutions to address <coughs> safe operation of both local and collector residential roads within the community. And there is in fact lots of things that can be done on an operational side in order to mitigate the penetration of commuter traffic through a neighborhood. Uh, my hope is that the community will take those recommendations very seriously and consider them. Um, they might result in a few minor inconveniences on your own road, but the benefit in terms of having less traffic on your road is typically quite, quite substantial. The objective in the city is in fact to keep car traffic, vehicular traffic on the main corridors. Leaside is probably one of the most extreme examples where vehicular traffic penetrates through the entire neighborhood. This is something that can in fact be transformed through very simple operational measures. And uh, for any of you who don't believe me, um, take a look, just head a little bit over to the west to Young and Eglinton, where you have neighborhoods that have operational measures in place where there's turn restrictions and you do not have rush hour traffic penetrating through the neighborhood. Uh, on the street that I live on, on Eastbourne, kids play hockey at five o'clock, um, on a Wednesday night on the street. There isn't traffic, it's simply because of those sign controls that keep the traffic off the street. So there are operational mechanisms that can be embraced that in fact will redirect the traffic and ensure that it 
it uh, doesn't come through the neighborhood. Another area to look is right at the terminus of the Allen Expressway. You'll notice that whole area around Vaughan Road. It's very difficult to get through the neighborhood streets because many have been turned into one-way streets, but there, there are many turn restrictions that have been added as well. That in part is because the Allen Expressway, when it was uh, cut off and ended, now dumped out right into these residential neighborhoods. The goal was to push that traffic back onto the main streets, to keep it on the main streets, rather than allowing it to compromise the quality of life in residential neighborhoods. So that is going to be initiated in 2016, and I understand the terms of reference for that work are well underway. I'd like to talk a little bit about the Committee of Adjustment. Councillor, I've not been paying attention to the time. I'm sorry, I just realized, I think I'm way over my time. I'm at 25 minutes, so I will, so I will wrap up in five, if that's okay. Um, thank you for that. The, um, the Committee of Adjustment, you can see in this next slide that we see a tremendous amount of volume with respect to the Committee of Adjustment. And in part this is because our housing market is so hot, and also because housing is very expensive. So people are renovating their house, staying in place, and making changes uh, to, their, to their homes. Uh, this is something that is going, this, these volumes, uh, 2013 was a banner year, 2014 was a banner year, 2015 is again right off the charts. I'm very happy to say that I have directed my, uh, my director in North York to hire additional staff in order to deal with the volume of Committee of Adjustment applications, but we're also very concerned about ensuring that we're getting quality outcomes. And for this reason, we're working very closely with the Committee of Adjustment around those new official plan policies around prevailing character to ensure that there is a consistent application of the policy framework. There's actually been not a ton of training for the Committee of Adjustment in the past, uh, as I discovered over the past couple of years. So this year we're focusing on really creating a robust training strategy to ensure that Committee of Adjustment members are well aware of the policy framework that they are charged with implementing on behalf of City Council.